Yeah, once again, we have liftoff. I want to thank you for tuning into this episode of the Big Truth Podcast. I can't look at you and do this intro and not laugh. <laughs> Why? Like, I don't know. I don't know. Just because it's my boy Johnny. Was it, you know, what, uh, what town are we in? That happens to me too, too. Yeah, yeah. I look at Johnny and I just cry. Yeah, yeah. We're in Londonderry, New Hampshire. We're at the uh, we're in the the smoking room of the uh, Amvets. Uh, yeah. 20, 27 <laughs> Legion Hall. The, the butt like shed. At the American Legion Hall. It's a <laughs> shed built off the side of the building. Yeah. It's great, though. It's great. It's great. Um, it's good it's to be here. New Hampshire. Yeah. So I, it's I'm a little here. too New Hampshire, really. Uh, they might want to dial back the New Hampshire on this one. The best place. is that it's, it's so New Hampshire, but it's literally just over the border. Yeah. It's like it's the stronghold. Like, New Hampshire's like, nah, this is New Hampshire. It's not Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. Here, yeah. We're here. We're like, here. How close to the border are we? I really don't have a sense. Not, not too far yeah, no? from here. It's... Uh, State line liquor stores close by? Close by. All right. Yeah. I have to look at the map. I, I apologize to New Hampshire to not properly look at the map. Just over the border. Just starting over the border. this podcast. Well, I should probably introduce my guest today. Sorry, yeah, it's cool. I'm here Stepped with Stepped all over it. Yeah, Sorry. no, no, no. It's, 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 all, it's all organic, man. All organic. But Hurry up because I've got questions to ask you. Okay. All right. We'll do it. We'll do it. I'm here with uh, my man Dickie Barrett and my man Johnny, uh, who's been, this is like your fourth yeah, third or fourth appearance, right? On the yeah, Charlie yeah, yeah. Rio. Um, you you were with me on the Billy Milano one. You were on, yeah. and then we I did, feel like a, we did some one. sort of weird COVID special during the whole during all that too. We huh? did together, like it, from, it, uh, via satellite. It, isn't that a little case of <laughs> foreshadowing? <laughs> <laughs> how many? How many? Uh, how many episodes did you do? I did one of my own, and then I did. I did. I've done a couple with other folks too. Why did you do one with Billy Milano? Because Truth came to Austin for I don't know if it was a he came to Austin for. I something. came to Austin for Wino's wedding. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Are and, these all brothers? And Billy, Billy, lived. you know, you do you remember? Do you remember a band, um, an old metal band, Saint Vitus? Yes, and, very well. Uh, yeah, and the obsessed is Wino from Saint Vitus and the okay. obsessed. I was going to his wedding because he's a he's a good friend of mine, and uh, Billy lives out that way. So so. We, Decided to get Billy on there too, so yeah. Billy and Johnny was the yeah. The theme. It was a, it was a anybody, weird one. There. Anybody near Wino's wedding was the no. was the episode. Well, no, because this, Johnny's my old friend, and he just rolled, yeah. we roll around, we're just rolling together. We yeah. roll around, and then we're doing the podcast, and we we had good barbecue. What was it Blacks? Uh, Blacks yeah, yeah, yeah. Terry Black, yeah. Oh, Terry that Black. sounds like Austin to me. Yeah, yeah, and then then we we brought it over to Billy's house. We ate, break, broke bread, and recorded a podcast. Yeah. But okay, so there was that one. Billy Malone and then there was Johnny alone. Exactly how you'd think it would be too. It was now the COVID special. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> you guys COVID trying special. not to say stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, two guys like I don't know. What should we say? There was a little. I don't want to get canceled. Little, Do you want to get canceled? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Truth. <laughs> See, I feel like you can only get canceled if you care about getting canceled. That's true. Right? I'm cancel proof. I don't give a shit. Right. What, what are you gonna do? Take away this? Like, I don't make money at this. Yeah. Like, yeah. Because I'm dumb. But it does really well. I just don't capitalize off that end of it because right. I do it because I like to do this. Right? You're talking to the chairman of the canceled truth. <laughs> I know, right I know, now. I know, I know, I know. So and we'll get into all that. And, too. I, and I'll also tell you this: I don't give a shit. Yeah, no. And I and I know that I'm right, and I know that anybody that thinks differently is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I'm willing to say that. Yeah. So for um, so Johnny's been on a couple times, so people have been yeah. introduced to Johnny, and I know I'm sure people know you from Impact Unit. <laughs> <laughs> they do most they of do. my fans you know, are impact unit fans you had a little band after that called the boss tones yeah Anybody but, but boss most tones. people with unit. any yeah hey who's who did the intro to your podcast that's uh murphy's i've heard law. it before I, it's, uh, murphy's law. it's right, that right, yeah yeah so what did you do you took jimmy's voice off of it or is it part no, no, of it no, that, that's, that's just that's, the beginning yeah that's just the beginning Sorry, Jimmy, I don't properly listen to your songs. And, <laughs> and Jimmy's uh, been on here, right? Oh, yeah. Jimmy's yeah. been on here. And, uh, he's another one. Yeah. He's like great. I listen Jimmy to Jimmy was on this pod podcast doing DMT, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy was on this podcast one time, and he was early on like, don't give a shit, right? Yeah. It was like before the park or was defending the park concert. I think so, yeah. And he, he was great. He was laying it out there. He's been on twice as like a like a 
like a, the only guest, and then he's been on another two times, I think, like you, yeah, uh, with uh, with other people when we do. A has group he group. ever been on with Billy Milano? <laughs> he has not been on with jumped. Billy Milano, but that would be great. <laughs> was That's he not me. at Wino's no. wedding? <laughs> no, he was not at Wino's wedding. All right. But any chance that the second time I do your podcast, Billy Milano can be here? <laughs> we can make that set happen. that up. We can, and then, I haven't seen him in a while. But Johnny will have to be here. Uh, well, when, no, Johnny. When, well, when the defiance, He's enough. What are you trying to break yeah. a record with Johnny? <laughs> when, when the when the, the see. When Johnny's on like this type of one, he's good because he knows when to come in. He, he'll like yeah. ask a, a, a point question and then disappear into the background again, yeah, yeah. chewing on a, a, a He's a cat phone, on a hot tin roof yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, he's yeah. so afraid of what Dickie's going to say. It's tough to be a side man for Dickie. He really says it all. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. I can, I can bring you in. You All of a sudden, you yeah. think of my pal, then I just smoke right. you. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a false security build, <laughs> build you up to we tell get, you down. Right. We I, a, I play him like a It's a bigger along. audience here, Dick. We got to remember. I used to do that to my mother. I used to have a radio show in L.A. I'm, I'm not bragging. Yeah. I'm just saying that back when there were such a thing as radio shows in LA. And um, I would call my mother, which is just an old radio morning trick, like, oh, the guy's calling his mother. And but my mother, I could, I would constantly like string her along, like uh, I'd be like, hey, Ma, do you remember when we uh, lived in Lowell? Oh, yes, I do, Richard. And we lived in the progress, right? Yes, we did. And, uh, and I was very sick at the time. Oh, it was scary. You were, you know, we didn't know what you had and everything. And, who was dad dating then? Richard. <laughs> Constantly get her like walk her along nicely. She's yeah. having a conversation and boom, hit her with something. She right into great. the trap, right yeah. into the trap. So like, why don't we, let's, I definitely want to talk about the defiant because that's. I only uh, want to talk about the defiant. Okay. <laughs> that and my mother on my radio show. Okay. So, but before we do that, let's give some context to people. Like, all right, let's talk about, to start with, just because this is always interesting to me as someone that's been involved in punk and hardcore the bulk of my life, like mm -hmm. how did like, and it's vastly different now than it was, say in the eighties. Like I got into more the mid eighties, um, but I know you guys were like you were like the first wave there. But like, what even got you into punk and hardcore? How did you find your way into that? Like, that's a pretty good question, and um, I was we we lived me and my friends. Uh, there was a kid that moved to Norwood in um, the early 80s, like 1980, maybe yeah. in 1979. And, and uh, he moved to Norwood suburb of Boston and he had a huge crate of punk rock records, like all the Newbury comic punk rock records. He had the, like the best. And we were like, oh my gosh, what are these? And we were fairly bored at that time. And, uh, you know, Sex Pistols, Ramones, uh, all of them, you know, yeah, yeah. specials, madness, all clash. And... Uh, Cockney Rejects had all the punk rock records and we just started listening to them. There's like five or six guys in the town that just started and I was one of them. Couldn't get enough of it. Go yeah. to the guy's house, listen to his punk records. And then we started discovering me and my friend Mark Higgins who actually made the Defiant video and he made the, uh, he made the Dropkick Murphys uh, shipping up to Boston video. He's in advertising and cuts commercials that you'll see in uh during the super bowl and stuff he's very successful at what he does and he was like johnny for many years he was he, not only my childhood friend but he was um a, a roadie for the boss tones he's the guy that would you know set up the gear and then you'd see him on stage policing the stage tall kind of overgrown dude but great guy if you know him you'd love him he's just a great guy and uh so me and him, he lived in Norwood too. He was from Dorchester, but he, he lived in Norwood. We're just really into this punk rock. And we, and we um, started listening to Emerson College Radio. Mm. They had a couple shows. One was Unsafe at Any Speed, and the other one was Faster Than You. It was two punk shows. Hardcore shows. And not, so now we're hearing, you know, all these early hardcore bands, Angry Samoans, stuff from California, stuff from D.C., uh, Minor Threat, Circle Jerks, all these bands. And then... <clears throat> we knew that there were Boston bands too, but it just seemed like, ah, we're in Norwood. It's like, you know, even though it's 15 minute ride yeah, yeah. at that time. But when you're a kid. A kid, it's like, ah, I'll, I'll just never get there. I'll never, you know, I want to be at these shows and these things are going on. And then Al from SSD and Choke were on one of those two shows and I couldn't say which one it was. And they were talking about, we're starting a scene. 
They're like, what does that mean? We're starting a scene. Come in. It's going to be you know, shows at the Gallery East. Come to what you know, whatever show. It's like, well, if there's going to be a scene. Me and Higgs are going to be involved. Yeah. So in we go. We head in and we catch the show. And then we're just part of it. And there's like 100 kids at the time, you know, the, the, the guys from Braintree, the, the Gang Green and the, and the Jerry's Kids guys, Bob and Chris. And uh, a few. <clears throat> then there's the FUs and those guys. I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure where the FUs were from, but it was John and, and Steve and, uh, and Bob played the drums. And, and then uh, DYS. Yeah. John was from Cambridge and... Uh, Smalley came up from D.C. or something. His father worked for the government. But, the, but a handful of people. But we were seen, and we were the Boston crew, and, and uh, you know, part of that whole thing. Because Al said, come in and welcomed us. And, then, and, and if you were welcomed, if you were in it, you were part of it. You get in the vein, and you go down to New York in 1982 and see SSD open for the bad brains. And, yeah. and, uh, and there was also like the... Uh, the, the North Shore guys, it was Jake, Jake Phelps, and uh, Punky, he was from Cambridge, but he kind of rolled with Jake and Gluehead, kind of. So it's just a, and it, and it felt really family-like, and, and exactly at that time when you're like coming of age, and who are my people, and where do I belong? I know I'm, you know, I'm not on any of the Norwood football team, although I got along really well with everybody at my high school. It was, I was sort of an artist and kind of trying to find my own place in the world so this was my crew and this yeah. was who it was and we were the boston crew we were the wolf pack we were the you know <clears throat> we were the guys that you heard about and it was and it was great and it was fun and our bands were good it yeah. was like they were world class and you know you put put them up against the la and the dc and the you know there was other you know, what what new york <laughs> God no, God no. God no. <laughs> at that time, at that time, yeah. If you remember, it was very adversarial. It was, yeah. Not and, just and, not just the sports teams. Yeah. No, New York and Boston were. We did butt heads, and I was, you know, the legendary story of how Jimmy, you know. So we'd go down to New York, and we were like, you know, we had our scene. We were tight. We were like, we knew it. And New York was still kind of scattered. There was kind of stuff going on, but. You know, those bands hadn't quite formed. Yeah. You know, there was, you know, the Beastie Boys were doing something and, and Jimmy was doing something. They were, they were getting it together. But we, we were, and so we went down to New York and we did some rock hotel or some show and we generally just kind of flexed. We thought we were cool. We thought we were happening. We were like, mm, we're slamming. We're Boston. We're Boston, not LA. You know, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you know, this DC can step to us. We're New York. And then New York stood back and said, hell no. <laughs> this ain't going on. Yeah, yeah. And they, there was a show set up and it was at, uh, it's on Huntington Ave on the YMCA or something like that. One of those, it wasn't, it was an unorthodox place that we really hadn't had shows at. And, so the New York scene comes down, and I think maybe Gnostic Front was there. Someone can look this up. I can't remember, and I was, it was short-lived for me because I came, and I was looking, and it was like New York was dominating. It yeah. was like psh, Boston was up against the wall. Jimmy was on the floor. I'd never even seen Jimmy before. And uh, Murphy's Law played it for sure, and they were just great, and they were just great. And then at one point, they had this thing going. They had a kid in the middle of the floor, and I thought the kid was in jeopardy. But it was just New York City style, you know, funkier, and the the moshing was, you know, it was moshing. I think we were still slamming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, and they had advanced to moshing, but yeah, now, they were almost even thrashing. These are all jokes, and they're bad. <laughs> they're bad ones. But at any no, no, it's good, it's good. Anyway, uh, I'm so, looking at the lady holding a drink behind you, <laughs> dancing <laughs> around you, behind you. That's what, <laughs> you got to, we got to get in her in here. She's got a better accent than you, Truth. Right, hey, you know, here's your drink, Big Truth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's New Hampshire. Was, uh, you know, New Hampshire for damn sure. Yeah. So, uh, so I stepped out on the floor. And somebody grabbed me, and down I went, and New York City put the boots to me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I was done. And it, and it was Jimmy primarily, and it, you know, it may, I was n never not an instigator, and I never stepped back, but it was like, I just, the next thing I know, I'm in the street, and I'm, I got like raccoon eyes, and my, uh, my mouth split wide open, and I was like, 
that's the last time I'll fuck with New York. But that's the funny thing, right? Is because everyone thinks that Jimmy is like happy. Have you ever time. heard that story, Truth? I've heard the story, yeah. but not not into that depth. But yeah. I know the the old clashes of New York and Boston. But that's like, where it ended. Yeah, <laughs> but everyone thinks I, it, certainly for me. I don't know. If, <laughs> I don't know if there's any shots fired back. But I was. Uh, uh, if anybody thought of it, I was like, Nah, we're good. <laughs> J- Judge even put it in a song on the Judge song. But uh, um, but everyone thinks that Jimmy is like happy, good time, Jimmy. But like when Jimmy, gets Jimmy down, is the toughest he gets, guy he I know, down, but dude, he's the best guy I know. Yeah, yeah. There's nobody better than him. That's I mean, why it's funny. That's cut to Jimmy sings on the first Boss Tones record. He, Jimmy sings on the opening track, I think. The Devil's Night Out. Is that the first one on that song? No, he does. Um, he does Devil's Night Out. No, he does. No, no, a little bit ugly. A little bit ugly. A little bit ugly. And, uh, you know, it's me and Jimmy. By that point, we're thick as thieves. Jimmy yeah. took the Boss Tones on their first national tour. They, out we go. And Jimmy, you know, taught us how to do it. We were, Joe Gittleman knew what he was doing, but he was reading from the, you know, early Jimmy G touring you know handbook he it, it, so the lawrence kansas story from from that tour is always one of my favorites i don't know if you lawrence that. kansas was great i think by by lawrence kansas it was fireworks uh handguns every everything goes and it was the out outhouse that yeah you know, yeah and it used we're to be a like strip uh, we're club, from yeah. boston we're like uh, uh but it's in the middle of a cornfield so any, anyway, you know, we're following the Murphy's Law van and the Boston's van and, you know, trailers behind us. And, and uh, all of a sudden, just corn. We're driving through corn. <laughs> like, and then all of a sudden, the roads are not roads. It's just paths Path. through the corn. And then we come, we're like, where are we going? You're going to love this. The whole thing is, where do we get to Lawrence? And uh, it was incredible. We played at the, at the outhouse in Lawrence. But, but so much, you know, which was born of, you know, Jimmy putting the toes to me for being a smart ass in Boston and daring to step to New York City hardcore um, became a beautiful friendship to this day. If I call, I mean, oh, yeah. you remember we played the park for him? Yeah, you played the park. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, just like it was no question. And it's like there's lots of you know organizations say you know could you play for this? And we can't play for all of them, but Jimmy, people you know yeah. called us the the your people and said do you want to play this and it was you know to the man there was no one we're there yeah, you know yeah, we're, yeah. we'll get there we'll do it but uh I, I value so much value my friendship with jimmy which is and when we talk about this if jimmy was sitting here right here like it's no 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 yeah, I, he yeah, was yeah. like that part of he's like no i was trying to hug you yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i don't remember it that yeah, way yeah, jimmy yeah. dickie come on come on yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah well you know he yeah. can't he can't even get his brain out i was like dude that went down but then everything from there on in was you're gonna remember it a little better than him like if you, if, <laughs> i feel like if you're the, sometimes <laughs> if you're on the receiving <laughs> end you're gonna I, I was just yeah. dancing, yeah, Dickie. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's how we did it in New York. Yeah, come on. <laughs> but so yeah, how did how did so when did uh, what's the story behind Impact Unit? Because like that's a a very in, in Boston that was a you know a very as Impact a young Unit kid that was like an three shows. Yeah, total. I think there was one in Western Mass. Uh, we opened like, up for the like Misfits. We opened up for the Misfits. Yeah, we with Deep Wound. I yeah. think uh, Jay Maskus' band out in yeah, Western yeah. Mass. But uh, then we opened up. The big one was opening up for the Misfits, and that was huge. Is that that? Um, it's the, the infamous the Misfits at the show, Channel. Yeah, 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 the Channel. Show. I've seen videos of that. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. I think, yeah, that, that show was amazing. I have pictures of me. I, I look like a, you know, Opie from. Andy Griffith's show, yeah, yeah. St- standing next to Daryl. <laughs> uh, 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 so, God, uh, yeah. So, Impact Unit had like th- three shows, but it was me, a guy named Sam, a guy named Ross, and a girl named Julie on the drums. Julie was from San Francisco. Sam lived in the projects in uh, in Roxbury, and um, that's where he grew up. And uh, Ross was lived in East Boston. And we just kind of like, you know, four misfits found each other and I got to sing for it. And then those are the days when Radio Beat was making those was making those hardcore. They did like uh, negative effects and yeah. early uh what else was Choke doing at that time? Those, last rights. I think they made the last rights record. They made you know, they were recording bands and uh they recorded us for nickels. 
and we're pretty proud of the recording. It's kind of an epic little uh, hard. No, I mean it was an influential record for like when I was a kid. You know what I mean? Like, and it was cool because you know, you know, not for nothing. Like SSD like had a little more reach. But yeah. when you found the impact, you need like, oh, this is a Boston. This was, you know, it was, it was yeah. cool to find, you know. And I still have my seven inch, you know. Yeah. And you were singing like Boston Strangler and shit, like yeah. fucking, <laughs> like fucking weird shit, you know. Yeah. Like, Fuck yeah, man. Uh yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty great, and I, and I love those people in that band. And it was, you know, the first sort of it was interracial. It was, you know, there's yeah. a woman playing very diverse. Diverse. I was yeah. very ahead of the curve. Very ahead of the curve. You know, accidentally and inadvertently. And at the time, it Is didn't it, cross our minds. Like, no. none of that crossed my mind as being, like, it wasn't calculated. It wasn't, any, these were the people that were willing to play with me. And these were people, and we all shared the same thing. And we were coming to Boston at the time. And there was, was less of a pool for people to pick from. Like, so you knew people from different things because it was yeah. 40 people in the punk rock or hardcore. You know what I mean? It was like, all right. We, but it didn't, but it wasn't yeah. like, it, you know, wasn't, you talk about, you know, I wasn't seeing color. I wasn't yeah, yeah. seeing, uh, these were part of the scene. Exactly. People that were part of the scene. And it wasn't, you know, like. It just wasn't. It was boxes that we had checked back then that if we were still checking, if you told me we would still be checking them now. And it was coming off of, you got to remember, we're also, you know, our older brothers maybe were involved. Well, Boston was a different place. Was involved in busing. Yeah, it was a different so place. So we were the kids that's you know, were looking at it going, this is fucking bullshit. But if, this is in the 80s, bullshit. if you walked around Southie, you still got, who are you? What, what's your last name? Yeah. And it better sound fucking Irish right, if, you, if, right, you, if someone right. asked you, you know. That I mean? was going on, but yeah. there was still, it wasn't the, bad. there was a movement still going on that was saying enough is enough. And, yeah. and I don't give a shit. These, my friends are my friends. Yeah. And, but know, it's like you said, though, it's like back then it just happened organically. You didn't have to worry about checking a box. Didn't it's, think it's a different, about it. It's a different thing now. Like we're Never almost thought like about a it. formula now. Okay, you start a band, you need someone from this box, someone from this box, and right. someone from that box. Could, so have, can, could have cared less. Yeah, of course. Never cared less. It was, do you want to be part of the band? Or, you, you know, do, will you accept me as part of the band? Yeah, yeah. And that's just the way it was. And, and Impact Unit was like that. And I think the Boston's were definitely like that. And I think no one thought. You know, and everybody, care, yeah. everybody else later made some sort of big deal about it, but it's never. Have you ever uh, kind of talked to any of them again? Who? The Impact Unit? Oh, God, no. Yeah, no, yeah. I, do. I actually do. Uh, do Ross you? actually made it. He worked for years at Filing's Basement, and then he got hired by a. That's the music. Yeah. Stott. Yeah. Stott. Then he was hired by a Adidas, Adidas, it's in some places in the world. And worked for them, and and may maybe still doing that. Sam's still with us. Uh, Julie passed away. Remember, Julie was on Barry's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Barry's gal, right? Who worked for the Boston's? Barry Height. Barry Height, right? Played drums for Slapshot and Blast Furnace. Oh yeah, yeah. See the Blast Furnace drummer? I think Come on. so. Yeah, that's that's a that's quite an accolade to be the, <laughs> yeah, on yeah. the Blast Furnace ever. I think he was the Blast Slapshot. Furnace drummer. <laughs> I got I got that guy a, a gig doing sound for um, Paul Westerberg. Okay. And uh, I went, I, I worked for Paul Westerberg for a minute in the, or just management capacity and got Barry Height because he had come off, he was on the heels of doing like, um, he had done the Boss Zones, but he also did like uh, Britney Spears, I want to say, or something like that. Yeah. So Barry had acquired a pretty decent resume at that, yeah. at that point. Um, so I hired him for Paul and, uh, and it was just Paul, playing acoustic guitar in these pretty big rooms and uh paul's up there he gets a little he gets a little feedback and he just goes because he knew paul i only told paul i said oh he he worked for the Boston's. he's a real good guy or whatever and he just goes he gets a little feedback on stage he just goes i'm one fucking guy on a, on a guitar there's no horn section up here what's with the fucking feedback or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and then they were going to canada the next day so that the the uh after the show he goes I want a new sound guy for tomorrow. And this is like Milwaukee or something. I'm like, geez, Paul, I don't know. You going to Canada tomorrow? We have these work permits, you know, all this yeah, yeah, stuff yeah, yeah. or whatever. It's a little bit of a rig of a moral. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you come up with one? I, told, I, managed to, I managed to keep Barry on board because, you know, it was, I just convinced Paul it would be an impossible task. So 
he made it, he made it through. But I thought I was going to get Barry all the way out there just to get fired. You know, it was like a three man tour. You Barry and Paul. I wasn't even on the tour. I was just working for management. I went kind of the first couple. I got Pete Cardoso on merch and or you know and uh, yeah. Barry doing sound. But yeah, it was like three guys, three and the uh, guitar tech for Pearl Jam doing doing guitars for him and. It was like star studded Johnny. Four or yeah. five of them on uh on a on a bus. <laughs> Johnny's done some work for some for some major players. It really has. In, in uh in in the management perspective, the yeah. tour managing perspective. I always think of Johnny if he's not immediately in my life, it's just sitting waiting for me to call him. <laughs> <laughs> he just waiting. Which I, I kind of am, though, you know? Yeah, yeah I'm just, it's like... Uh, I got the Dickie phone I, in my house. Is Dickie calling? I'm like, yeah, oh, what, what, that. what have you been up to? And I expect, no, just nothing. But like, <laughs> yeah. usually he has a long list of shit he's been doing. Oh, yeah. I'm a very fucking loyal guy. It's like if somebody... Because if somebody Dickie really gave me my first decent paying job in music, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, back, you know, in the 90s, we, uh, we met at a... Well, we didn't meet there, but uh, I was working for Dropkick Murphys at the time, and they were still coming up. And uh, I met Dickie and Joe Gentleman over there, like a Joe Strummer show. Mm. And uh, they were like, "Man, come, 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 fucking work for us." It'd be way, you know, offered me decent money, and I was like, "Oh shit, okay." So you stole them from the Dropkicks? Dude, right. we didn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, Johnny's a very loyal guy, but yeah. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's one one cool thing though is like when you talk about the old Boston crew and it's like you know a lot of dudes are still around, still doing stuff, Blossom. still involved in music, still good guys, and I'm still you know friendly with many of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know I know Jake passed and everything, but like that was sad. It that was hit sad. Me hard, but like people don't know like he's the guy that started Thrasher. He's a Boston right. guy. He's Everyone the guy that made. Th- he didn't start it, but he made Thrasher. Well, what he it made was. it what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah he yeah. definitely made it what yeah. it was. He, and, he, and that was he his was thing. The like, face, you know. I remember because he was my, me, him, and Andrew Brady. If you ever heard the Boston song uh, "Toxic Toast," it was about us living together. Like Jake is in that song, and, yeah. and uh, we lived together in an apartment on Queensbury Street, which we weren't paying rent. This is like <laughs> eighty one, eighty two, and. Uh, we weren't paying rent and we, just because we couldn't, and, the, and they shut all the power off. It was freezing cold, and we just lived in this place. He was a bike messenger, and I was working at a Super Salad in Kembo Square. I think Andrew might have been a bike messenger, too, and, th- th- and that's where we lived. We were real close friends, real good buddies. And then he said at some point, uh, I'm going to go to uh, San Francisco and work for Thrasher Magazine. I'm going to go work for Thrasher Magazine. I was like, oh. Doesn't seem possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, like, cause we love Thrasher Magazine. Sure, yeah, yeah. And he was an insane skateboarder. He's like the skateboarder's skateboarder. Cambridge like, Pool. Yeah, Cambridge Pool. Uh, Jake and Joe used to. I mean, uh, Nate and Joe used to skate there. Yeah. At the Cambridge Pool, and uh, but he did. He went to California, and he became, you know, the editor. And by the time he passed away, he was, you know, for years he had been the editor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Like, you know, like John Nassis went on to like get huge. In the, I still the, talk the to John. Yeah, yeah. Like people did stuff, but they're still doing music stuff, which is yeah. shows you that I don't know how to explain it. Like that wasn't just like a lifestyle or whatever. That was like this was ingrained in people. Like, yeah. you, like it really was. I owe so much. And, and, you know, if we can circle all the way yeah. back to when I started this interview and talked about uh, listening to Choke and, uh, and Al on unsafe at any speed and, mm. and you know call you know call went out come in be part of this i can't ex- you know i can't say enough how much it meant to me like i was who am i in the world at that time who besides the guy listening to this guy's punk records who what is my you know and i never ever thought i would have any sort of career or life in music yeah but, yeah but i owe so much to the early Boston crew and to them welcoming me and, and being a part of that and loving it. And I, and I took all those values and everything that they instilled in me, which was, you know, brotherhood and unity. And it's about, you know, we're, we're only as strong as, you know, all of us together and, and, uh, and all of that. And it was, you know, anti-racist and it was, it was welcoming and it was, and, yeah. carried that with me through everything I've done since. Yeah. It, it, I think it's like, because it, everyone's like, 
but punk and hardcore, I think, like puts that stuff in you. Like, but yeah. it's like because of the people around it. Yeah. And it was it was something special, especially back then. Like, especially I, back then. I wasn't there for that first wave, but I was kind of caught the end of it in this, the second wave. Um, you know, I, I, and I never look back. Like I'm like the I'm guy, so glad that's how I grew up, even though it was hard back then because, you know, you had you weren't fucked with by people like townies and jocks and this and that. You were fighting all the time right. and whatever. But yeah, I, that had made it even better. It just made you a stronger person. The guys that that have been into it since before you know, whatever the commercial success of punk and hardcore and stuff. Yeah. Those guys are just a different breed, you know, in terms yeah. of that element of the, of the scene, the brotherhood of it and all that kind of, you know, yeah. was there commercial success of punk and hardcore? You had a little bit of that. Yeah. You might've, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I wasn't making a joke. Yeah, I just, yeah, no. I was just, you know, I kind of, you know, that, all of that went into making the Boston's, but it was very, you know, wasn't, the same. I, I, yeah, I mean, yeah. no. in that early, we made that early hardcore record too, that Boston Tones record with, we were covering Minor Threat, covering SSD, cover, you know, that yeah. was one of the things that was very important to us. It's like, this is where we come from. I think we made a heavy metal one too, which was Metallica. Metallica, yeah, yeah. Van Halen, yeah. and uh, what else was on there? I think Bob Marley was on there sure. too. One question I do have though, like, is, and you know, we don't have to get super into Boston's, but you get um, one question truth and I'm right. out of here. <laughs> what did, did you ever expect like the Boston's to be like, you know, cause I, re no. I remember seeing the early shows at the rat and everything like in your wildest imagination, Never, like, ever. how did it, how did it go from being the band at the rat to like, cause that's fucking insane. Perfect storm. Right place, right time. Yeah, yeah. Something had to give. You know, we, from building, from having people like you at our shows, from really, you know, catering to them and, and embracing them and saying, you know, this is about us. And, it, and it's, it's not just, you know, the punks. It's not just the townies. It's not just the giants. Everybody come to our shows. It's yeah. all, all welcoming and doing that. And then it was, it was the heyday, like the pinnacle of college radio where, having a college radio song was huge yeah, and reached a lot of people. Yeah. So, so, you know, where'd you go? Had legs and did really, really well. You in had the Converse radio. all-star commercial. That the was Converse all-star commercial did pretty good, but by then we were rolling, you yeah. know, you couldn't deny the, our shows like the paradise. We would sell out the paradise, would yeah. sell out the, the channel or wherever we were playing. And, and, uh, but the Converse sneaker thing definitely gave us, you know, worldwide who are these guys kind of recognition but i think it was just you know our work ethic and we just put it in and then what jimmy taught us about going out on the road we went to towns and said we're in your town and we give a shit about you and come out if you yeah yeah you know if you're in college if you're here if you know those early tours must have been hard with so many people it was uh because you know you know a band four or five I, is tough I to do i oh, wouldn't yeah. change i wouldn't change a thing it was probably grueling and agonizing and all those things at the time and you're sitting in a wet suit and you yeah. know 12 passenger van with your buddy right up against you on both yeah. sides and you know joe gittleman at the wheel heading for it you know whatever the next town is you know hopefully your suit would be dry by morning yeah 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 <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but i wouldn't i wouldn't change a thing i would not it was wonderful sure as as brutal as it sounds and you know i think we were all smokers at the time too in the bit except for nate so like a, a wet a wet smoke a smoke cigarette <laughs> yeah, smelling yeah, yeah. wet suit ah, <laughs> sweaty dude sweating, like, that's sweating before, out all the beer and yeah. shit but, and that's before the uh when you could still smoke in clubs and let stuff, me punctuate yeah. it with it was wonderful it was so great the, uh, that we had the opportunity to even do that that we were even doing it that yeah. we, you know we loved it and then People were pumped when we pulled into their town and when, you know, hanging out at the venue beforehand and like, here come these lunatics out of their van and they just keep coming and they got horns and they got yeah, that yeah, guy yeah. dancing and all of that stuff. And so, you know, we brought it. I, I felt like we delivered and uh, it was super exciting. Yeah. You know? You but, guys in Kings of Nothing should have did a lot more touring together, so you would have to have way more guys and a piano and I fucking. Love, <laughs> I love those Kings of Nothing. Did you tour with the Kings of Nothing, Johnny? You did a couple things in Europe with him back yeah. in, back then. Yeah, Tor Tor was a great guy. R.I.P. Man, rest yeah, in peace. Yeah. He was a fucking, terrific, terrific, great, great, talent. great guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great band too. He was, but, a good, yeah. he was a good hot rod guy too, man. He knew he, you know he got his yeah. way around cars and shit, man. Are but, you a hot rod guy? Truth. 
Or just I'm, the motorcycle guy? No, both. Both. both? both yeah. What do you got for a hot rod? The only uh, vehicles I have right now that would be in that category is I got a, a 67 Impala. Ah. And I got a 70 uh, C10. Sounds sweet, dude. Ooh. I'm in the middle of transforming the Impala, but it's running and driving, so. Hell yeah. Let's go. I got to do a, I want to get it painted, but I'm going, I got I got to save up for this paint. Are like, you doing low rider with it? I'm going like full, oh, nice. full retard with it. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to, I got to save up because it's going to be, the paint is going to be more than I probably have into the car at this point. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. But, um, why are you a hot rod guy? No, but no. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, He's yeah. in old trucks right now. I was actually telling him to get a C10 just because I like you and, uh, and then Brent before you. And yeah. You know. So, Everyone likes the everyone likes step sides. I'm I'm a long bed guy because I like to be able to put a bike put in a the bike back. in there. Yeah, yeah, I got a long bed. Do you? What do you got? It's a Toyota. All right, it's yeah. cool. The long beds are cool, man. I like the way they look, yeah. especially if you got them like slammed down it's and stuff. Toyota Tacoma and and people with short beds look at me like jealous. Yeah, in Arizona, as I drive by with my. Is it, are you living long. in Arizona? Yeah. All right, where where? I don't know if I want to tell you. No, what town? What town? I don't. I don't, I don't need your fucking address, dude. Come I just through. <laughs> <laughs> like Phoenix area, Tucson area. Um, I have a place in uh, Sedona. Okay. Outside of Sedona. Yeah, I know Sedona. I lived in Arizona. That's you did I where? There. I lived in uh, uh, Tucson and Flagstaff. Ah, Flagstaff is nice, right? I'm yeah. close to Flagstaff. Yeah, I no. get that Flagstaff snow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had to drive through Sedona to get to Flagstaff, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I know that area. It's beautiful out there. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And it's a great place for a hot rod up in Flagstaff. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, except that it snows more than it snows here. <laughs> does it <laughs> or it really? did, yeah, because it's 7,000 feet up on a mountain. It does, but it goes away. Yeah. And it doesn't. they don't put salt down, so it doesn't ruin oh, yeah. vehicles. They put, yeah. like, a volcanic rock down or something. No shit. The coolest thing about Flagstaff in the winter is you, you can drive an hour and a half and go to a show in Phoenix. And you go through like four different environments. Yeah. Like you're in snow. It looks like you're in Maine. And then you end up in a t-shirt and shorts. You're in shorts. And yeah, it's yeah, like 85 yeah. degrees. Like, you yeah. know what I mean? And all in an hour and a half. Like, right. It's bananas. Like, but, My uh, sister has a place in Scottsdale too. Yeah. The kids go to school there. Yeah. Down and, yeah. So, and I enjoy it. I moved from uh, LA to Altadena and Pasadena to in 2021. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's something that prompted that move. In what that do you time think? Frame. What yeah, yeah. <laughs> just coincidentally, yeah, just coinc off the top of my head, and uh, yeah, my kids wanted to play with other kids, so yeah, we had to get the hell out of Altadena. Yeah, so tone is nice though. Do you do you out and harvest the uh, the energy of the vortexes and? I've got crystals. <laughs> you got crystals. And, you, you yeah. know all that. You got a little crystal yeah. shop going on. Yeah, there. I do. <laughs> Essential oils. I got. I do it all. I all things flags that. For a while, he was announcing for the Kimmel show from his living room in Sedona. Right, right now, I'm in ceremony. Currently, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, one of my favorite. We um, I DJed a party in Sedona. Yeah, it was in the middle of nowhere. They, right. they brought generators, and it's out in the desert or something, in, or on the Red Rocks, like out, that? out in yeah, out in the desert. Like it was the it was bananas. No shit, like huh? this is like '97 or something. But when I moved out there for school, but it was just. Crazy. I still was there a drum in. circle? No, no. It was all like, it was all like hip hop stuff. Like, and I was yeah, DJing no, hip hop. Not stuff. anymore. Just yeah. drum circles. Just drum circles. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you know. Well, you, that's probably a good place to take a yeah when ayahuasca first, or something. Johnny makes a good point. When I first moved to uh, to Sedona, Camp Verde, outside of Camp Verde, was I know Camp Verde. Me. Yeah. I, I almost died in Camp Verde. Badass little town. Well, hot now. Tell me that. That sounds more interesting. Just, just in a car accident. I was a passenger in a car accident. You know yeah. those roads and the you, the speed limit's 75, so everyone's going yeah. 85. And a, a truck pulling um pulling a, like a- wasn't a long bed, was it? No, no, no. Okay, it was it was, it, it was a it was a truck pulling a um, an airstream, an old vintage airstream. Ah. Uh. And then then after the airstream, they had another trailer with Come on. quads on it. Yeah. And he was going off the side of the road, and he veered really quick, and then like the trailer with the quads just kind of spun out and hit hit the car that I was in, and we went spinning. We almost went, you know, those cliffs. Like, of course, we almost went off a two hundred foot cliff. Yeah. I was like, this is like I had the proverbial life flies yeah, flashes yeah, before. Yeah. I was like, hey, this is it. You know what I mean? Like, I thought we were going over the cliff, and then another truck hit us and spun us, and we hit the side of the mountain. But Jeez. it was yeah, I was out there. Near were you in urgent care? Um, 
Yeah, for the night, but then, but it was like the next day they were, I was out. It wasn't. That I'm wondering where they took you. Did they take you to Cottonwood? I don't remember because they had me on morphine, so I don't ah. remember anything. I think it was Cottonwood. I think it was. Yeah. And uh, my roommates from Flagstaff had to come get me. And yeah, uh, yeah I just oh, remember dude, that. That's gnarly. That was bananas, dude. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was, on behalf of Camp Verde, I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. It's cool. Yeah, I had a lot of friends from Camp Verde that went to school in Flagstaff, so that's why I know that area. I love that area, man. It's beautiful out it's there. It's so cool. We shouldn't be talking about it because you're going to get more people <sighs> to move there. I'm sorry. I don't. I, I'll, I'll edit this out. Well, you already got your house, so it's cool. <laughs> It'll only help yeah. your property value. So I, I moved there and I found a house, and then uh, my um, brother in law. Was he's from Worcester originally, as is my wife, and he was a Sedona police officer at the time. So, mm. was, and he had kids, you know, too. That my, my kids' cousins, and they loved each other, and they were, you know, so it was a place where, you know, with the, all the masking and all the everything that was going on in California at the time, and you know, kids are you know virtually playing with each other, and yeah. playdates were all off the table, and. Oh, that I was like, oh, this is a drag. And how many years are we going to take away from these kids? And you know, I could, I was doing that TV job remotely like this on a microphone in my garage in Altadena, and I um, said, you know, fuck it, I'm going to go to somewhere else where the kids can and their cousins, and the Sedona cop was there, and uh, you know, my wife's sister, and so we headed towards, you know. Arizona to that area and found this place. And then we had to kind of renovate it. So for we're living in a you know horrible house and trying to renovate this other house it during the pandemic and when, when there's no one up, no, up there. Yeah. I mean, even if there's no pandemic, like to get a camp camp verde crew together to Yeah, yeah. Know, it's like and just to get the materials and everything. Materials were brutal. Every single in, everything yeah, yeah. that came in, the yeah. guy was shaking his head going, uh, the price of this stuff. I'm like, God, is there you know it's Ryan Packer. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Ryan Packer is a... Wow. <laughs> wow. This is great. <laughs> Packer, great to be here. What's up, buddy? You. Good to see you. <laughs> well, say hello. Say hello to the Big Truth <laughs> audience. Oh, dude, he's, on, he's yeah. been on like <laughs> he's been on 30 of me. Right. Yeah. Is he your number one Big Truth guest? <laughs> oh, he's, he's, a, he's a co-host at this point. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> what have we talked about, Packer? We, we've covered a little bit of choke. We did a little bit of slab shot. We, <laughs> we, did, a, we did a little impact unit. We, we did, did some uh, unit. We getting beat up by Jimmy Gestapo. Oh, yeah, we did. The old New the York Boston City Boston rivalry. <laughs> well, gosh, how long have we been in this room? Five days? For, 42 minutes. 42 minutes. We're, <laughs> answer me this. Now, here's where we are, and, and this is why we're in, in uh, New Hampshire, me and Johnny, right now, is we've put together a show, a small show with. Um, do we have the list of people who are playing? We do. And. Uh, so it's in here in New Hampshire, and if you're listening to this, you're not going to make the show. No, it's already, because it's already happened. Yes, this this, this is. Uh... Yeah, so we got Brian McPherson, Sweet Babylon, Casey Darren is playing. Casey Darren played a huge part in putting together the show, and me and Johnny from the Defiant were here at the American Legion Hall. That and Truth came down to interview me yep. and Johnny for this, and uh, the show is. Tonight, and, to, and, to, and me and Packer here to, in a security capacity. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, very secure room. We're very secure. This is a very secure room right now. So far, so far, Packer has inebriated people at the bar. Do you think they're going to be any problem tonight? Uh, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. The, the biggest problem is that a tall Tito's and soda is six dollars. There's a toothless so, woman yeah. down the end that looks a little unruly. We just paid twenty four dollars for this same drink at Danzig last uh, a couple days ago. Danzig. Yeah. Where was he playing? MGM uh, across from Fenway. How was that venue? I've never been. It's a good room. The if sound, I ever the, did the throwdown again, would I do it in that room? Uh, I just punch my code. Yeah. We don't we don't share a passcode. Yeah, we'll just, <laughs> I'll tell you what your passcode is in Packer. <laughs> Let me give you the numbers that are not your code. Yeah. Yeah. Give me another hour. Maybe I could I could get you can it. Crack it. Crack it. Yeah. Crack it. But I'll tell you the four numbers that don't work. All right. So that's going on tonight, and this is in support of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Somebody, a candidate that me and Johnny are very excited about, and that's who we're backing. And you know, talk us out of it if you want to. Um, we're willing to listen. If you got a better candidate, come forward. 
And I know people are going, ah, everybody's better. <laughs> yeah. think, ah, what's wrong with these guys? So I, mean, the, the, I hate politicians in general, but he seems to be the <laughs> He's lesson. not a politician. Exactly. Exactly. All right? When he's a politician, if he wins, God, please, if he wins. When he wins, then he'll be a politician. But so far, he's never been a politician. He's been a lot of things, and he's done a lot of things, a lot of great things, including saving most of this country's major waterways and rivers. And that's he's dedicated his life to preserving and saving and, and saving people's lives and only caring, as far as I can see. And maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. But as far as I can, and the words from his mouth sound great. And sure, maybe I've been snowed in the past, and, and I've lived a lifetime of... It's the lesser of two evils. It's the lesser. I'm sick and tired of the lesser of two evils. I'm tired of that. How about, how about give me an option? The, the lesser of two evils brought us to Trump and Biden. That's exactly. it, but it's <laughs> right? always that's been like, that I'm, way. I'm like, dude, but it, that's the crescendo of, the, of, of it, right? You know Truth, what I mean? I'm older than you. Since I was born, it's the lesser of two evils. That's always what. Eh, like, yeah. How about give me a choice where the word evil isn't involved? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. So, and uh, so I've, I've known him for a while. I've backed him for a while. I grew up Irish Catholic in Boston. So the Kennedys played a huge part. You know, did, my father did, loved the Kennedys. Did you guys have a picture of JFK in, up yes, in your house? That's okay. what we had. We had a picture right, of so, JFK. And then next to JFK was the Pope. And then next to the Pope was Larry Bird. Okay, so you grew up in a real Irish Catholic Boston proper, sad, proper really Boston, sad, kind of Boston pathetic. Boston. pathetic. <laughs> you and and everybody in the neighborhood, his name wasn't pictures, Bobby, yeah. his name was Jackie. You know, it was Bobby and Jackie, uh, the brothers. So that was the sort of neighborhood I grew up in. Um, that's, but that's, you know, my father loved Ireland. And he went there once. I mean, that was the type of, you know, he's, to this day, he's got a scally cap on his head and a green sweater. And, you know, Dickie, you're Irish Catholic. And, I, I mean, when I tell him I know Bobby Kennedy, he, he looks like he's going to cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the kind of dude my dad is. Yeah. Did, when, did, when, did you send him a picture? Of, of course you, I do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> send, if I meet any in the buddy on the Red Sox, I send him a picture. This kid's unbelievable. <laughs> he knows them all. <laughs> I don't even know where he is. I used to send him when we started touring. I used to send him postcards from all over the world. He's like, I can't, the kid's in Japan. <laughs> uh, never, Barrett's have never been to Japan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would thrill him. It saved yeah. the postcards. That's awesome. Do you ever go back and look at all those postcards? I'm sure he still has them. They're all over the fridge still. Still? 500 <laughs> years old. <laughs> all like yellowing with, yeah, with age yeah. and shit. But Remember um, the time you went to Melbourne, Australia, Dick? Yeah, we got the postcard right here. I want to. I want to get into the defiant and everything, but we just got we got like two little things to talk about here before him because there's a lot of space in between the Boston's and the defiant, right? Or a little okay. bit of space. I don't but, know. Well, no, no, not space, but like I don't know how many people know it, in the punk rock scene. I'm sure a lot of people know. But how did you get hooked up with the that job on Jimmy Kimmel? Like, how did how did that come about? They, it. A time came with the Boston's, and it was known as the hiatus, where, you know, after the success of, uh, let's face it, then we did, um, uh, we did Pay Attention, another uh, major label record, and... Um, Jackknife to a Swan. Then we did Jackknife to a Swan with Side One Dummy, because... Uh, the record label got huge, like, just this big. Seagram's brought out... Um, Mercury Records and a shitload of record companies and they all of a sudden formed Universal and uh, Def Jam Universal or Def Dan it was involved too so this was big label and we, and we just didn't we couldn't compete and couldn't be part of that and didn't want to be kind yeah. of you know everything got sort of in front of us and then we ended up making a record for Side One Dummy with, with uh, Bill Armstrong and Joe Sib had a record label and and uh, but at that, that point, it was like we'd just been on the road so much for years and years, and that's what you did. You were out there, and it's like, you know, up and now I was looking back and going, wow. And can we do, I was approaching 40 at the time, and can we do uh, anything else? And is this it? Is this all I'll ever be? Which was great, and it was more than I ever expected to be, you know, to be able to send postcards to my father from all over the world. It was way past what I, you know, I had myself slated for, roofing houses or tending bar which i would have been fine with and but that's kind sure. of was my path and my direction and then all of a sudden through the grace of god i'm in the mighty mighty boston's and we're having success that we never 
really strived or tried to have, but kind of happened to us, which was absolutely wonderful, as I mentioned earlier. I'm trying to catch Packer up, too, while I'm <laughs> telling you. So, uh, so, uh, so it came time to, like, let's take a break. You know, let's, we've done this. We did it. We won all the awards, bells, whistles, everything you can do. And let's take a break and then figure out and do it again when we want to do it. And as that was going down, um, Jimmy, who I knew from radio, from doing morning radio, going into every market. And, you know, most of the time it was Johnny waking me up in the morning going, you got a radio interview, Dick. Come on, get up. And me and Johnny would head over to the local radio station and I'd go on the air. And I loved, actually loved doing it and met really cool people and, you know, and I took it seriously and I sure. tried to give them as good a radio interview as I could and try to be funny because you're in, you know, Cincinnati and, and you're the biggest thing in Cincinnati because it's not like LA radio or, or, you know, New York city where, you know, but you're the biggest thing in town and tonight the Boston's going to be playing and here we got Dickie from the Boston's and he's here. And I, I made lots of friends. Sure. And in, in, to this day, I still have friends in different markets who, who are still like journeyman radio guys. And that's really what Jimmy was. And he was in different markets. So, you, you know, I met him up in Portland or Seattle at first. And then he ended up down in Florida. And then he was out in the desert. And then he ended up on K-Rock in L.A. And he was Jimmy the sports guy. And he was really running the Kevin and Bean morning show. And Adam Carolla was involved in it, too. And so and I went on there and, you know, it's now it's LA and I was trying to give them the best radio they could be and Fumpy trying to be funny. And most bands that would go through, the guy would be like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's a night. I don't give a shit. But I was trying to be like more than that and funnier sure. and tried really hard and, and learned to love the people I was talking to. And Jimmy was one of them. And then he heard he was starting coming off the man show and everything he did, it was kind of like he, he presented the man show to me one time. He's like, I'm going to start, I'm going to have a TV show and uh, it's going to be like girls on trampolines and monkeys farting, you know, dude stuff. And we're going to be drinking beer and it'd be me and Adam. I'm like, that's never going to fucking work. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Out of mind. You mind? I'd be like, yeah, it'd be me and Adam. And, and the thing was like six seasons of the man show with Adam. And, and it was that launched for the funniest comedians. Cause like after them, it was Rogan and Stanhope. Well, Rogan After and Stanhope yeah. didn't handle and as much as I love Joe Rogan and even Doug Stanhope now. Stanhope is one of my favorite comedians. Very funny, but yeah, they yeah. didn't handle the man show right. He's in they, Arizona too, another Massachusetts. He is. He's yeah. out in uh, uh, that, that uh, weird the, the little Irish Bisbee. town. Bisbee, yeah, 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 yeah. Bisbee. I hope we didn't blow it up for you this thing. No, he knows but, he, he but, talks uh, about it. I, I met him out there once so just randomly at a bar and it was, it was a good time. Terrific was guy, yeah. funny guy, and yeah, yeah. you can't argue with Joe Rogan's success either. That guy's no, huge now. No, no. And and uh and I admire so much of what he does and listen to his podcast. But they took the, like Jimmy and, and Adam understood that it was, the joke was always on them. The yeah. joke was always on men. And it wasn't like, you know, just guys flexing and like, we're guys. Blah, blah, blah. It was, you know, we're guys and we're stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are the dumb things of guys. And you got to love us, but this is the, you know, imbecilic things that we think are funny. So, so that's why it lasts. When, when Doug and, and Comedy Central gave the show to those guys, and first of all, they weren't friends like Adam and, and uh, Jimmy were. And second of all, they didn't kind, it kind of became what it wasn't, what people th who never saw it thought it was. Yeah. And they just kind of did that. And it didn't last long, and their hearts weren't in it, and it kind of folded. But so he's coming off of that, and he says, you know, and, and you know, once again, he said, uh, I'm gonna have. A, I'm gonna start a late night television show. I'm gonna be hosting a late night television show. Do you want to be involved in that? And I was like, and this is back when those things were dying on the vine every day. This was uh, Magic Johnson had a show, and Chevy Chase had a show. Okay, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Joan Rivers, like, and you know, one of the Wayans brothers. They were trying out who's the next, you know, Johnny Carson, who's, and uh, I think one network had Jay Leno, and the other network had. Uh, who then? Jay Leno? Letterman. Letterman. Was yeah. he still in? Yeah, he was still on, I think, when we got yeah, on. So yeah. we were the third network, and we were going on even later. And um, I, he said, you know, well, do you want to be the, the uh, announcer on the show? And I'm like, well, I can barely talk. <laughs> <laughs> you 
you know, have you heard? No, no, it's going to be great. And you just come, you just, you know, yell, and you'd be rad, and it would be great, and you, my buddy will be there, and you're there. And, I, I, you know, I, I go, okay, this will last a month, and uh, I'll be home, but the Boston's will crack up when they see me pretending I'm Ed McMahon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I lasted 20 years. It's crazy. And it was great. And I loved, you know, every minute of it, right up to the last few minutes. Uh, but the most of the time there, it was, you know, it was fun. It was great. It was enjoyable. It was... Uh, they had a they had like a bar backstage there at the at the Kimmel show, but not just a bar, but it was like full serve. They had spread food, everything, so it was like guests and friends of Jimmy and stuff like that would you could hang out. It was and watch a green a show room experience. It would been just, to most of the green rooms, but it was a green room experience. That was sort of what he was trying to set up. I think the like the first few shows which I wasn't involved involved in, he was serving alcohol to we were serving alcohol to the audience. And that, that didn't, <laughs> didn't that go worked. well. <laughs> that one, I said, this will never work. And that one, I was right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That people were shit faced in the audience. And yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. fun, fun. Like all, all the other late night, you do Letterman, it's stuffy and miserable. And you're well, just. Well, it's in New York, so there's limited space. Yeah. Let's be fair to it. Yeah. And doing Letterman was a thrill. Yeah. That was great to be there. But but it's, in, it's limited space. Like, you know, your New York City apartment isn't your you know, California apartment, you know, you're living yeah. in a shoe box, you know, Jimmy's listening to this podcast right now, somewhere, in, <laughs> somewhere in Queens yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a one bedroom, you know, and it's costing him a fortune. Yeah. Not <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Gestapo. Jimmy Gestapo. Yeah, 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 Jimmy. Yeah. Let's get to Jimmy's right. Yeah. 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 So he's listening. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it's, I'm going to tell him too. I'm be like, the first 10 minutes of the podcast, we're just talking about you, Jimmy. Yeah. yeah. He'll, he'll tell, a, tell him we peppered you in the, the rest yeah, of it, yeah, too. Yeah, Make yeah, him yeah. force him to listen yeah, to this nonsense. I will, I will, I will. <laughs> Jesus, Dickie, uh, I had to listen to the whole show. Uh, so, you know, so I, there I was. That's how I ended up on that show. He asked me. I said yes. And then a few years into it, you know, I ended up doing that radio show, but I also ended up, you know, the Boston's like, well, let's, you know, now that thing, the pressure's off and now that, you know, let's, let's go out on our own terms and not because we have to and because we got to work this record because let's just go out and enjoy it. Have and fun we, again, yeah. We built it that way and built the, you know, throw down back up again and built the, you know. Jimmy's schedule allowed for him to be able to book tours when the show was off kind of thing. Okay. You know? It's pretty good. It all yeah. kind of worked and, it, and uh, it was great. Yeah. What about... I didn't know too much about your radio show though. What what was uh, what was that? I had a morning radio show on a station called Indy One Hundred and Three, and Indy was built to kind of compete with um, K Rock. Steve, Steve Jones had a show, right? Well, that's where that was, and yeah. there was like uh, uh, Camp Freddie had a show. Those guys and uh, Joseph had a show too at night. Like they were having like you know people in punk bands and people in bands. Joe Escalante. Joe took over my yeah, show that's right, after took me. Over, yeah. yeah. When I said I can't do it anymore, and and I wish I did stay, but it was they were, so it started out. You know, you're gonna have a morning show. I called it the Mighty Morning Show, and you're gonna do, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can mm. play whatever you want, have all the guests you want. I was bringing in people from you know Jimmy's show, asking them the night before. You come on my radio show. It's not on the Miracle Mile. Super Dave, <laughs> Super Dave was my favorite guest. But uh, and I could do four podcasts on Super Dave. Being Super, Super Dave Osborne. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right. Bob Dick, Einstein. One, 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 Dickie loves, and yeah. Funkhauser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> From the Curb Your Enthusiasm. Who was this guy in? Fuji? Was that a sidekick? Fuji was a sidekick, yeah. <laughs> 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 he would explain the trick. And then <laughs> Sidekicks? The way he looked at Fuji, too, like <laughs> his face was so like dead serious. <laughs> sidekicks are not utilized enough <laughs> no, dude, nowadays. We no. all need sidekicks. So important, man. Huh? How yeah, we gotta find some sidekicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Johnny's mine. <laughs> Johnny's mustache is mine. It's yeah, his mustache. Just Sometimes like Johnny's everybody's sidekick. He's pack a sidekick too. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you know what the thing is though. We're all each other's sidekick. Kind of. We're, yeah, we're yeah, symbiotic. Yeah. Pardon me, um, Johnny is only one person <laughs> sidekick. Respectfully. <laughs> Oh, no, um, I'm a Colgan's here. Uh, okay. <laughs> Excuse me, fellas. I respectfully um, 
would like to tell you that Johnny has been my sidekick claim, for you, many, you, many. You're, you're pulling up claims, pulling claims. Yeah, uh, McCogan. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's doing his McCogan impression. I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I realize it. So, um, so. Yeah, so that's what we did. So that's what he did. And that then that turned into the pandemic. And the pandemic came along and I had very, very specific ideas of what I was going to do and what I was willing to do and what I wanted to do. And, and, uh, they didn't include getting the COVID shot. Yeah. And I, and I was going to protect my family from it with all of every fiber that exists within me and myself quietly, personally, could I have done it? Sure. You know, but the reason I didn't was because I knew that there were people that, you know, followed what I did. Yeah. And believed in what I did and, and be believed in what I said. And I couldn't do something and tell them, yeah, I did this, but it's not, you know, I didn't want to. I couldn't yeah. say that. I couldn't. There was a I, lot of that going I, around. I, but I spent my life, you know. Or I, you need this to come see me play. I didn't want to be that guy either. I didn't mm -hmm. want to be part of the, you know, bait, as you say. You know, if you want to see the boss tones and you got to decide, so I said no. And then, and then. I knew that people would be like, well, you know, Dickie got it, so I guess it's cool. I didn't want to be that guy. Yeah. I didn't want to be have anything to do with this. I couldn't. So all of a sudden they found out, you know, I wasn't going to get this vaccine and, and it was caused a lot of difficulty. And I'm still do I was still doing the show remotely in a garage while that house is being renovated in Camp Verde. And I'm still, you know, from Hollywood, you know, every night. But the, you know, the, the walls were closing in on me any day now. And Jimmy now knew that I wasn't going to get it in no uncertain terms. And he wasn't at all happy with that. But he was, you know, was doing the best he could to protect me. And, sure. you know, but, you know, Disney was moving in and it was, you know, it was scary and sad. And like, I, I, I can't believe what the world's becoming, but I still wouldn't do it. I still said no. And, uh. Then a mandate came down, all Disney employees must have this. And then I said, well, I won't, and I won't let people think I do. I'm not going to pretend in any way. And so uh, I was ousted. And, and around that time, too, is when um, Bobby Kennedy got in touch with me. I heard about your hard times. I heard what happened. It's, you know. And he said, you know, would you like to um, record a song? I've got a, a freedom uh, rally coming up in D.C., a mandates thing, and I want to do a parody song of um, a Graham Nash song from called Chicago from years ago. And I, I've rewritten the words, and uh, do you think you could get you know produce it and create this song? And I did, and I found a guy that sings like a bird in Sedona and um, put together this track, and it came out really well, and it's you know, and Higgins made a video for it that, which was beautiful. And like, just, it stood for, you know, no mandates and medical freedom and the right to choose and, and all of the things that I believed in and, you know, and the stuff that I felt was moving towards us and going to steamroll over us and hoping, praying that it wouldn't. And while at the same time, you know, going, you know, there's no way you're touching my children. And so it came out good. But when the, um, when the rally took place, he compared what was going on to Nazi Germany, as people do. Yeah. People have been comparing things that our government does or, you know, any organization does to Nazi Germany since Nazi Germany. But that's when the press and the media pounced on him and said, you know, and that's when, you know, the Bostons were super uncomfortable. Members of the Boston, certain members to certain different degrees. Um, we're like, you know, what's Dickie involved in and not really knowing and not really, but saying I didn't sign on for this. This isn't, you know, what I'm, what I'm, you know, this is the band and this is the thing. And, it, and I was like, you know, I, you know, don't, didn't want to bring any of this to you guys, but this is what I believe in. And these are the things I believe in. And so that caused the second split that caused us to say, okay. Time for hiatus number two. Sure. And that's what we're currently in. And then at the time... When, Roll, when, when Rolling Stone magazine, you know, calls you an anti-Semite, it's kind of scares off the, you know... Yeah. Well, the, you know, they they didn't really understand it. And, and Rolling Stone, you know, is 
now notoriously stupid and 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 i have no real love for that magazine well rolling stones it's like notorious that the dude was working in collusion with certain three-letter agencies and, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what Are I you mean? talking about and, noah yeah yeah it's yeah, like, yeah it's public knowledge now you know what i mean so it's like noah's they're uh, basically a tool for the for the no that dude's a ska dude you know is he yeah he played for the stubborn all-stars he was a bass player <laughs> yeah yeah so he should be loving you He's not. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Yeah, I yeah. thought I'd get some Scott love. Scott brotherhood he, going. He really, loved them. he really loved them in high school. Yeah, 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 yeah. Back when he was stubborn all the time with his new with job. Yeah. He was, but no, I think I'm, I think I'm the enemy. But uh, so, so that's what took place. And that caused and people were like, you know, it is what it is. And, and at the time too, now, so all of this, you know, my world is blown up and, in the meantime, it's public. So now, you know, it's in the modern world, you, you know, strangers have to attack you on social media. But the problem is it's public, but it's reduced to sound bites, So people don't get the whole story. They get the little clips nah. that, they, that they want to latch on No one onto. wants to listen. They're, they're, right now, they're making clips of this. Yeah. And I'm going to sound super stupid, but then that's fine. So that, And that's the way the world works. But, you know, they're coming at me, you know, so it's like, oh, my God, I've just taken a huge hit. You know, the things that I've done this for 20 years and I've done the Boston's for 40 years. And now, I, you know, what am I going to do? And I did what I always do is just started creating and started writing and started thinking and putting pen to paper and, you know, and called friends and people that were thought like I did and, you know, who I loved and who loved me and uh, found people that, you know, said, well, this guy... The offspring just threw this guy out of the band. I wonder if he'll drum for a band that I put together and then called, you know, Pete Parada. And uh, he was like, I'm all in. Let's do it. And, then, and it was, and called Greg Camp, for, who was a guitar player for Smash Mouth. And of course, you know, I called Johnny last because I just knew he'd do it anyway. <laughs> Which is right. you know, I'm a little bit busy right now, Dickie, but okay. <laughs> I'll do what you say, like I always do. Yeah. Sidekick <laughs> obligation. Yeah, sidekick. Yeah. As my yeah. sidekick, Johnny was yeah. obligated. Yeah. What are you and, doing uh, now? <laughs> Joey Briggs was from, uh, Joey LaRocca from the Briggs. He, um, we started writing songs with him too. And, and if the song sucked, then we would have, you know, would have been short lived, and we wouldn't have gone too far. And be, ah, it was nice and fun, and we gave it a shot. But you know, to the song, like one after another, it's like, God, this is really good. God, this is great. Do you love it? Am I wrong? Am I crazy? Is this great? And then, it's, you know, five guys all that I respect and and musically and creatively are, you know, agreeing. Like, I think that this is special. And before we knew it, we had an album full of songs and then some that you know we can shelf and uh we greg's ability to record stuff was top shelf and then we sent it to a guy named tj um who mixed it he works in uh, hellcat records and he mixed it he was involved in mixing and making uh he was the engineer on the last boss tones record and he, he'd stepped it up a level too and it just came out great and uh, you know I got Johnny to, to um, testify. Am I Absolutely, right? Absolutely, 100%. If I'm talking bullshit to your no. friend Truth, Johnny, you speak I up. I would call you out on it. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, and have Packer throw me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Packer, don't go easy on him. I, I would want, do anything I, I, for Ryan Packer. <laughs> I, want a, I want a full Nelson when you throw me out of here, Packer, all right? Treat me like just any other asshole. Packer's been with me for many years. That's where you're his sidekick. <laughs> Knock off the bullshit. <laughs> Try, you know, you're his boy. He's not your boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, I, I don't shine shoes no more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, will, will there be plaid pants uh, involved in the defunct? No, I feel like that'd be silly. Only on Johnny. <laughs> He's got to wear a, an old pair of mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're often for that was a good question, though, Packer. <laughs> we're opting for Argyle. Yeah. <laughs> Mustaches and plaid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, that, did that I ever tell you what Stigma me. said about the mustache, by the way? I'm no, just going to throw a quick stigma story All right, here real go ahead. quick. Yeah, th there's he always goes, time for a stigma story. He goes, uh, he goes oh, oh, you got a right, mustache on? Yeah, it looks, looks pretty good. And I go, I don't know, Vinny. I'm on the fence about it. He goes, yeah, I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> That's pretty much a stigma as it gets. Yeah. I, I, I mean, as long as you're selling sausages on the streets of Chicago, dude, that mustache is perfect. <laughs> it's fucking perfect. Yeah. So, so, so the defiant. What's uh, when's uh, when's the album rolling out? October twenty seventh. Right. Yeah. And we got a new or the the second single is coming out. Yeah, the next couple of weeks or so. Gosh, right? we got to do this show tonight, Johnny. Yeah, we do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we put together an acoustic ragtag acoustic thing that's going on. In yeah, here. it's okay. It's an American Legion Hall. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's low key. I think. Yeah, you know, maybe we'll go out there and surprise me. Maybe there's people out there, but. So can it can can I get a sneak preview? Not right now, obviously, of the second single. I heard the first. Yeah, one. absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give him a sneak preview of the whole damn album. What do yeah, we care yeah, for? Yeah, 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 no doubt. All right, cool. We'll talk about that after. All right. Fuck I that. give people sneak previews, though, Truth, and then then it doesn't feel like they listen to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I listen to shit. Can I get an advanced copy? Yeah, sure. A week later. Hey, how'd you like that record? Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't download it. I couldn't. It's like yeah. Trouble. You didn't call me listening. back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, fuck yeah, man. So what? Um, what's kind of like the... I, and I had one of my Patreon subscribers, I said I, that you guys might come on today, wanted to know what were the influences uh musically behind the band i think everything we brought to it i think this yeah. influences I, I don't think there's any you know it's a piece go, of everybody's past i would yeah, say right pretty much yeah I you mean, wouldn't like it's all heavy hitters that have long past in, in musically so yeah. i think if you know those bands which people do if you know johnny's band what he's been doing it's like you know who his influences are it wasn't like you know, all right, well, now we're a new band. Let's come up with some new influences. Yeah. So it's like a little bit of impact unit, a little bit true intentions. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you hoping? For, I'm sure there's not enough hardcore on it for no, you, I'm, Truth. I'm, 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 I don't listen to just hardcore. We're all melt, melt I know, but you're an aficionado of it. Hey, yeah, the man, you know, the man you know romances a He doesn't romance the ladies with an old uh, Judd record, you know? Yeah, you know. <laughs> Boston came around one night. Yeah. came to show what I always noticed about that lyric, and I called Mike Judge on this when I talked to him. I was like, it was like Boston came around one night, pushed him to shove. We were down to fight. Never said who won. Yeah. Yeah. Just said we were down to fight. Yeah. New York was down to fight. Yeah. So yeah. it was so basically it was Jimmy versus you. That was that was the uh, fight. it was it was Did it turn more into a melee? Or was it no, just it was guys? clear. It was clear. <laughs> I, I I got the brunt of it, but yeah. it was it was clear. If you I mean if you dared to say, I mean I think those lyrics are pretty damn good I think that's right <laughs> <laughs> he came around one night and then they you know but yeah. it wasn't the message was sent yeah for sure to, so, to so, rap to, to end up the way where we started I think so that was uh, speaking of messages being sent I mean I think people can see from the foreshadowing that we've talked about that's been threaded throughout this interview like let's talk a little bit about the messages of the defiant because that's that's what the most important thing is with the band, I think, at this point. Thank you for asking. The message is unity. It's the one I've always preached and what I've always talked about. It's bringing people together. It's we're not different. We're not, you know, you can think this. I can think this. You can choose this. I can choose that. But the strength and the beauty and, and, and society is a thousand times better if we say, okay, now let's put that aside and let's be human beings and let's, you know. Let's embrace, let's enjoy life, let's enjoy the things that we all share in common. And uh, it's, it's funny because the, the, you know, the naysayers would say, you guys have changed. When the irony of that is that every fucking buddy else has changed. We're, I'm the same guy. I know Dickie's the same guy. Yeah. You know, he still has, you know. I don't know if everything, everybody else has changed. I think something's been instituted and something's been, and something's been put upon us. And there's, there's people that benefit and make money from us being divided. And I think that that's the message of it is we shouldn't be. And we, and we should find out, you know, let's trace the thread and go, who, okay, who is prospering? Who is benefiting? And why are we letting them keep us apart like that? And it's like... Yeah. You know, everything has to be divisive and everything has to be, you know, this is your team. And you, and you have to hate that team. You gotta hate the other team. You gotta yeah. hate I You mean, can't talk to you them. Know. You can't you have to pretend that they're evil people. Yeah, and let's let's be honest, you know, it's like as funny as it is to go New York, Boston, Yankees, Red Sox, everything, it's like 
it just really wasn't about that. It no. wasn't about, we loved the same things, me and Jimmy. We wanted to do the same things. We wanted to entertain the same people. We wanted to bring people together. We wanted, and that's what we wanted to do. And it wasn't like, uh, he, uh, uh, it was, and that's exactly what it is. It's like, I don't, I don't, I don't have to share every single, th you know, thought and idea and value and everything, but the core ones, the ones that are important, the things that I've always talked about, family, friends, love, unity, those we can all share. Yeah. Those, those we can all agree upon. If, if you don't like your family, if you don't like your friends, then fuck off. Yeah. Get new ones. You don't, kind of, <laughs> Get kind of, new ones. Don't yeah. believe yeah. that. Get the wrong ones, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, but you know. I am I mean, on my fourth wife now almost, so. <laughs> yeah. Fourth wife, like <laughs> eleven kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like fucking whatever. <laughs> It'll work out one of these It'll, times. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, and I know, like, but where along the lines did that messaging fucking leave punk rock? Because that that's what pisses me off. Like, and, and I talk about it freely, and I know. You, you you might not want to, you know what I mean? But it's, like, here's the thing, like. I don't know. I'm, I'm getting like stumped, not stumped here, but I'm getting, um, I got 4,000 things trying to come out at once. But like, like I take it very personally that like punk rock got co-opted yeah, during yeah. the last like five well, years. Well, there's an assumption court. that if you disagree with somebody on even Something. substantial things, that that must mean because now you're, on my you're a, say you're of this political origin or whatever. If you disagree with me on certain key elements, then that must mean you're with this other crazy fucking thing. That's what's you know crazy what I mean? right like, now. It's like the world is more nuanced than everyone wants to put it right now. So if I don't agree with someone on one thing, now I'm a right wing fucking right. nut job. Everything's black and white. There's and I'm no like, shades of gray. No, no dude. It's like, just, look at my shirt here. One like, team or right. the other. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. on either team, dude. I'm right. like fucking, you know, I'm not on either team. That's right. the problem. Right. Like, and, but I don't think I thought ever, I was on the team of those people. You know, I thought yeah. we were all on the same team, you yeah. know, regardless of who. And what, and you know what I mean? It's But I think that came back to what you were talking about earlier when we were kids and younger and there wasn't as much going, there wasn't as many people involved in the scene or whatever. Like I knew kids that had all kinds of different backgrounds with all different yeah. beliefs. Right. And we got along because like the music shit was more of the unifier yeah. and it was us versus them, meaning society. And now it's like literally like society's overtaken this, well, you know, and, and it's like a little microcosm of It's of, like in the, the 1980s, world. we talked, all the songs were bashing on Ronald Reagan, right? But it wasn't, we weren't bashing on Ronald Reagan because there was another guy who we thought was way better than Ronald Reagan. No, we because you were going to bash on the next guy right, too. exactly. It was just exactly. he was in at that point. Right, right. You know what I mean? It wasn't it was, that it was like, oh, we're fucking bashing on Reagan because there's this other dude that we... That's sing better. about that's yeah, yeah, awesome, yeah. that's going to yeah. save us no, all. No, it's it like, like... He was president at that time, yeah. Right. Mm. Granted, we're you know all old men now, but yeah, <laughs> salty, salty old men. Nah, yeah. Boomers yelling at the sky. Yeah. I'm Gen a I'm Gen X. Okay, all right. So, okay. Sorry, so am I. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a millennial. <laughs> Gen X guys yelling at the sky. Yeah. The the thing about it is everything's been co-opted. Is that it's, the name of the next record, by the way? Yeah, that's a good sign. Right? <laughs> everything's co-opted. I think that I think no Gen X guys point. yelling at the sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either one. We're either one. Uh, everything's co-opted is on my new album. Yeah. Gen Xers yelling at the sky. <laughs> The, um, ev that's the plan is to is to divide us is to say you know everything you can go it's punk rock but it's everything it's yeah been, no, you know, it's, I just take it more personally when it gets into the world of punk rock and choppers yes that's, that's, I take your, it more personally that's, that's, that's yeah. your world these shouldn't have been these you were know. always question authority fucking whatever you know what I mean so right. sure speak truth to power blah 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 which is just all catchphrases now, you know. But I mean? how do you think, you know, Aaron Rodgers feel about sports? You know, it's like yeah. when did this come into sports? When did the, you know yeah, everything has to be? That's a good point. You know, the, the, it's all co-opted. Yep. You know, and nothing. You know, they they got to touch it all because if they don't touch it all, then then it doesn't work. You know, and the, and there's you know people that are leaning against it, and you know their problems, and we got to figure out, you know, what do we do with Aaron Rodgers and. What do we do with Dickie Barrett? And, and so that's that's part of it. But I haven't, I've, I've, you know, I, I, I'm not just an old 
you know, Gen X or a boomer, or whatever the fuck you want to call me, yelling at the sky. I've been yelling at the sky since I was a kid. I was yelling at the sky when I heard Choke and I heard Al say, come in, you know, come into Boston and let's all yell at the sky together. I mean, those songs had very clear messages and clear, clear, you know, the things that the Dead Kennedys said at that time, I held to my heart. Nazi yep. punks, fuck off. Yep. You know, and still to this day, I, I bought in hook, line, and sinker and, you know, if anybody's acting like a Nazi, if there's any fucking Nazi attitudes, that was our thing. You know, when we were on stage, it didn't exist. We gave it no oxygen. We shut it down. We cut its life source immediately. And that's, I will do that to the very end. And when it was time, you know, hey, let's go. Now's the time. If ever we needed that spirit and ever we needed to join forces and go, okay, they're really fucking with us now. They're yeah. really fucking with us now. The government is telling me I have to fucking inject this into myself. But Dickie, it's just putting people in danger. I don't believe that. No. I believe that this is dangerous. I believe that it's not smart. I believe at the very least it's not one size fits all. Yeah. You know, what you, you know, you can have that cranberry and vodka or whatever you drink in there and that agrees with you and that's fine. I could give it to another guy who could fall on the floor. He's highly allergic to cranberries. We're all different human beings. So sure. to say that here it is, here's your dose. This is the medicine. This is what everybody's going to get is fucking lunacy. Yeah. And for people like like the guy that drums in the, in the Defiant, Pete, it's not going to work. It can very much affect him. He took a shot one time and his arms wouldn't fucking work. Eric Clapton was playing guitar and thought he was never going to play the guitar again because he got the COVID shot. And then all of a sudden he has to be vilified by the same ska dude, Noah, and, and Rolling Stone because he's saying, I don't advise people to get this because right now I don't think I can pick my guitar up. I got it. Pete got a shot at one time. So the one size fits all thing smelled bad to me. I'm not going to play that game. I know that this kid here but that's is a sensitive in, to good. That's a tenant in medicine. Well, that's, that's how medicine everyone works. Overlooked it. It's called everyone. practicing medicine. You go into and your doctor says, all right, I'm going to assess you. I'm going to evaluate you. You're my patient. I'm going to tell you. And then the government comes and says, no, 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 no. Everybody takes yeah. this. In the case of our drummer, he had a medical condition that the shot, one of the listed side effects could have potentially killed him as, you know, listed by the thing. So the doctor, his doctor advised him, don't do it. Well, that, you know? that's the thing. So, so when, you know, I looked around and said, hey, no, at the very least, this can't be mandated. People should have the choice. It's freedom of choice, freedom to choose what goes into you. And that, you know, I looked around, I was like, everybody's with me? Turns out, no. No, yeah, nobody was no, with you. Yeah, yeah, like dude. Ten no, dude. Ten dudes were with you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're All with right. you, Dick. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> Your sidekick is off. I think Johnny was days away that. from getting I don't know one. what the fuck he's saying, but I got his back. <laughs> sidekick is obligated. Yeah, he was. He was. I knew that. I go, Johnny was days away. I actually called him, and he was he was about, just about to get my shot, boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, Johnny. <laughs> Ah, uh, truth. I want to go and see what's playing here. I yeah, I know. really yeah. enjoyed doing this podcast, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I would love to do it again. I, I know. We'll do it again. I know we're... I know you got another question. No, I don't got I no more I can tell. No. I'm looking at your I a, eyes. I got a million questions. Did I sadden you? No. Yeah, I'm very sad. <laughs> Did you and enjoy I'm, talking? I'm not going to be effective as a, as a uh, security agent tonight because I'm going to be a little melancholy I bummed you out yeah you bummed me out because we're only I had some hour impact and unit questions no, I, I wanted to ask you about regular boys haircut I never got to it <laughs> <laughs> now we'll do it again I know we're, we're in the we're in the green room the smoking green room of yeah. the show and it's about yeah. the it's already kicked off so we're gonna uh, cut it here um, where can people find out more information about the Defiant and things you got guys you guys got going on go to uh, Defiant official Instagram and, and yeah. there's a website same with the Facebook page do we have a web oh yeah yeah. I don't I don't even know Defiant music yeah just hit me up there, afterwards there is a website. shoot me a yeah. thing and it'll be in the show notes folks so you can uh, follow it there thank you so oh, much yeah. Drew alright it's been you. a blast talking alright we'll do it again Bye.